It can be difficult sometimes to hear these familiar stories. Over the years of their telling, they have accumulated so many layers of meaning and interpretation that we sometimes hear only what we've decided they mean, rather than hearing what they have to say that might be new or unfamiliar. This story about the call of Simon Peter might be a good example. Simon is a fisherman. He's used to catching things for a living. When Jesus comes along, he leverages Simon's natural talents and abilities and gives them a new target. From now on, you'll be catching people. It's a nice story about what discipleship means, an example of how God uses the gifts and skills we have. Even those gifts and skills that might be completely unrelated to anything churchy, to further the work of God's kingdom. But is there more to the story than this? One thing you might notice about this story is Simon's reaction to this large catch of fish. How does he get from, holy smokes, that's a lot of fish, to, go away from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man? There's a leap there that Simon takes, and I'm not sure if we all follow that with him. A less observant fisherman might have offered Jesus a job after a haul like that. <laughs> but, G but Simon sees something else here, something deeper that's happening. That call to stop and listen, the way that Simon pays attention to what's happening in the story, or the way that we stop to listen more deeply to the retelling of this story, that call is at the heart of our observation of the season of creation this year. We take this time to set aside our normal routine, even our normal lectionary, and enter into a time of listening and contemplation so that we might hear these voices that we normally tune out. The voices of those who suffer the impacts of climate change, for example, or the voices of folks from other communities and cultures who hold wisdom about how to live in harmony with our planet rather than in dominion over it. And ultimately, even the voice of creation itself. Those whose vocation it is to observe these voices, folks like climate scientists and ecologists, can tell that something is not right. The dynamic balance in which our world exists is shifting rapidly. It's always shifting, but now it is shifting perhaps too rapidly for us to adapt. Changes in climate that previously happened over the course of eons are now happening over the course of decades. In today's story, Simon learned something valuable by listening to the voice of creation. And so today we are invited to ponder whether there is something for us to learn from listening to that voice. As I observe what's happening in our world, one thing I think I see is that there are a lot of unintended consequences. It's no one's goal to change the climate or to drive species to extinction, in that these things happen as a result of our actions. For example, of particular concern to us in the Pacific Northwest is the salmon population. There was a time when salmon were so abundant that they not only sustained the entire uh, community of natural predators, but also entire human communities. And then in the March of Progress, we did things like dam rivers and clear forests and any other number of things that might adversely affect that balance and their numbers began to dwindle. As I think about this, I think about Job. Job is well known for his suffering, but the book bearing his name is a poetic account of him and his three friends attempting to explain why he suffers. His three friends are convinced that because Job only punishes the wicked, Job must have done something wrong. Maybe he doesn't realize it, but clearly he had to have done something wrong. Job, on the other hand, protests and asserts his own innocence, and eventually even comes to the conclusion that God has wronged him, that God's unfairness is to blame for his suffering. In the climax of this story, which we begin to hear today, God shows up in person and asks, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? As God questions these men about their experience and their wisdom, it becomes clear that they don't know nearly as much as they think they do. No, they weren't there when God laid the foundations of the earth. 
No, they haven't commanded the dawn or walked the recesses of the deep. God's point is this. How can these men, to whom all of these things are unfathomable, possibly not know how the world works or why God does what God does? And so as I think about this, I wonder if perhaps we also are inclined to darken counsel without knowledge. We think we've got all these things figured out. We can make electricity from running water and plastics from crude oil. We can build cities and automobiles and space stations. But do we really know the full ramification of any of these things? We know how to get what we want from the land, but do we know what the land needs in return? There are those who know. There are people who have lived in balance with these things from time immemorial, who have not only survived but thrived alongside creation. They are still here, and their wisdom is not entirely lost. And, of course, if we are willing to listen, the land itself and the creatures in it tell us what they need in voices that we can hear, if not that speak our language. God answers Job out of the whirlwind to humble him, to remind him how little he really knows. By the end of the book, Job still doesn't know why any of these things have happened to him, but he has come to understand that nothing is as simple as he thought it was. In Luke's gospel, on the other hand, I notice that Simon isn't humbled by his experience with the divine, at least not in the way we understand humility. Instead, he becomes, away from this encounter, empowered. When Simon first discerns that something bigger is going on, his response is humble. Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. He feels that he has no business being in the presence of such holiness. Jesus, however, begs to differ. He invites Simon to follow him, to join him. Instead of sending him away, Jesus draws him closer. Jesus invites him to listen to what the lake and the fish are saying to him. That massive catch of fish isn't just a neon sign pointing to Jesus. <clears throat> it is first and foremost a message of abundance. In Jesus' presence, the waters that were empty just hours before now teem with fish. But that abundance isn't limited to the lake. Jesus takes that sign and interprets it also as a foreshadowing of what is to come. From now on, you will be catching people. The implication is clear. Just as Simon and his friends brought in this huge number of fish, they will similarly bring in huge numbers of people to hear the good news. <clears throat> and you notice that at the beginning of the story, before the fishing trip, that's already happening. Jesus is surrounded by such a crowd that he has to teach them from the boat. Even these crowds, the story seems to say, are nothing compared to the crowds of people who will hear the gospel from Simon and James and John and those who will come after them and who will continue to proclaim that message. Crowds that will continue to grow through the passing millennia. <clears throat> in each story, Job and Simon are mistaken about their roles in the story. Job thinks too much of himself. Simon thinks too little. In each story, God intervenes to tell them the truth about who they really are. And that, my friends, is the real definition of humility. It's not self-effacement or denigration. It's telling the truth about who we are. And the truth is that both Job and Simon are important players in God's story. Job's lesson is for us as well as it is for him. And so is Simon's. And that's why we continue to tell these stories. And that's why millennia after these men died, we know who they are. So with that in mind... What is the truth about who we are and how we fit into God's story now? 
Perhaps like Job, we think too much of ourselves at times. Maybe we are overconfident in our abilities or give our own desires too much weight so that they outweigh the needs of others around us. But maybe we are also sometimes like Peter, believing that we are too small, too insignificant, too sinful to be a part of what God is doing here. The voice of creation says otherwise. It says that we have been called since before the foundations of the earth, destined to be adopted into God's family. It says that we have already drastically reshaped the world around us. If we can do this for the worst, then perhaps we have equal power and equal opportunity to do it for the better. For a long time, we've been told to believe that the story of salvation is just about us, about humans. And yet, since the very beginning, the voice of creation has testified to the interconnectedness of all things. All creatures thrive together, or they all languish together. Species come and go, yes, systems and balances shift, but when stability is found, it is always in the equilibrium of everything within that system. So why should humans be special when the same God who created all of this also created us? Even Paul, writing 2,000 years ago, saw this. In Christ, he saw God's plan for the fullness of time revealed, a plan to gather up all things, things in heaven and things on earth, together in Christ. This abundant and prodigal salvation, that's what God does. That's what we hear from the very beginning in Genesis, when God spoke into the darkness and created light and created the fish of the sea and the animals of the land and the birds of the air. Before human intervention reduced their numbers, the innumerable salmon in the rivers and the sea testified to this abundance. In fact, I wonder if maybe that is how Peter recognizes Jesus in this story. Maybe it wasn't his power to command the sea or the fish, but the unmistakable sign of abundance that convinced him. Abundance I might add, that was so great it actually destroyed his livelihood. He caught so many fish that his nets were torn and his boats nearly sunk. Never before had he experienced that kind of abundance. But in following Christ, his life was forever defined by it. In the wreck of the aftermath of this abundance, Jesus says, Don't worry about the nets in the boat. You're not going to need them anymore. From there on, you're going to be catching people. Today, we hear about what the voice of creation has to say both to Job and to Simon. How it testifies to God's mystery and love. What does creation have to say to us in this moment? I wonder if the abundance of the earth even now, even after so much abuse and neglect from us, if that abundance might in itself testify to what God can yet do, to what God is inviting us to do. They say the salmon were once so abundant that a, work, a person could walk across the rivers from one bank to the other without ever getting wet. Maybe might the voice of creation be inviting us to experience such abundance from God again? What wisdom is waiting for us in these voices that have been ignored or silenced? What wisdom might help us find our way into that abundance?